God bless you beloved. I greet you in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ and I thank you for giving me this opportunity, this privilege to come into your home, into your car, wherever in the world you are. So may the Lord just bless you. This is Brother Elmo from the Cape Town Tabernacle Church and I will be sharing with you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other gospel than the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that the Lord will just be with you and that he will bless you and touch your heart and touch your life in a marvelous way. So, beloved, before we go over into studying the Word of God, I just want us to close our eyes, bow our heads wherever we are, and just thank the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this grace, this opportunity that we can gather around your Word in your name. You have said with two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in their midst. <coughs> and now I pray thee, Lord, that you will just be with us, Lord, and that you will bless us and touch us. Lord, open the understanding, open the eyes of all our loved ones. And I just pray, Lord, that you will break the bread and just feed the hungry souls. Be with us now and bless us together. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you, beloved. Thank you for those of you that are tuned in on the program, A Study in the Word, with me, Brother Alma, from the Cape Town Tabernacle Church. And I'm just here to do the work of an evangelist. As Paul was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And by the grace of God, that is just that what I want to do, is to fulfill my ministry and to just preach the Word, to be instant, in season, out of season, and just to declare the word of God to the peoples of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ gave a commandment and he said, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And he says that we should make disciples of all nations and of all creatures. And that is just what we wish to do. That is to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the entire world. And tonight we shall study the topic of the sword of the Lord. Now some people might never have heard about it, but God is a sword. And it's written in the Bible about the sword of the Lord. And we shall read in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 21, from verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward Jerusalem, and draw up thy word toward the holy places and prophesy against the land of Israel and say to the land of Israel thus saith the Lord behold I am against thee and will draw forth my sword out of his sheath and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked seeing then that I will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh from the south to the north that all flesh may know that I the Lord have drawn forth my sword out of his sheath it shall not return any more sigh therefore thou son of man with the breaking of thy loins and with bitterness sigh before the, their eyes and it shall be when they say unto thee wherefore sightest thou that thou shalt answer for the tidings because it cometh and every heart shall melt and all hands shall be feeble and every spirit shall faint and all knees shall be weak as water. Behold, it cometh and shall be brought to pass, saith the Lord God. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, say a sword. A sword is sharpened, it also furbished. It is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. It is furbished that it may glitter. Should we then make mirth, it contemneth the rod of, of my son as every three. Three, and he hath given it to be furbished that it may be handled. The sword is sharpened, and it is furbished to give it into the hand of the slayer. Cry and howl, son of man, for it shall be upon my people, it shall be upon all the princes of Israel. Terrors by reason of the sword shall be upon my people. Smite therefore upon thy thigh, because it is a trial. And what if the sword contemn even the rod? It shall be no more, saith the Lord God. Thou therefore, son of man, prophesy and smite thine hands together, and let the sword be doubled the third time, the sword of the slain. It is the sword of the great man. 
the sword of the great men that are slain which entered into their privy chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates that their heart may faint and their ruins be multiplied. Ah, it is made bright, it is wrapped up for the slaughter, go the one way or other, either on the right hand or on the left hand, whithersoever thy face is set. I will also smite mine hands together, and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have said it. May the Lord Jesus Christ add his blessings to the reading of his word. Now, beloved, the Bible speaks about the sword, the sword that belongs to the Lord. So God has a sword. The Apostle Paul was writing even about the full armor of God. You can find this in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 6 and from verse 10 where he was describing in detail the full armor of God. So God has an armor and part of God's artillery or God's weaponry is a sword. Now this sword is not a literal sword. It is not a physical sword as people used in medieval times or even in ancient times where soldiers would go into war and then they would use swords to uh, slaughter and to to do combat to battle but God is a sword and this sword is his word the sword of the Lord is the word of the Lord and yes the Bible describes in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 12 it says that the word of God is more quick and more sharp than any two-edged sword and it speaks that it cuts asunder it cuts asunder the flesh and the bone soul the spirit the word of God is like a sword a sword that is sharp we read even in the book of Revelation chapter 19 we see a man that is coming is riding on a white horse and we see that this man has a vesture that is dipped in blood and it is said that this man is called the word of God and this man is no one else than the Lord Jesus Christ he is the one whose vesture whose clothing is dipped in blood he is the blood sacrifice he is the perfect one he is the supreme being that died for you and died for me on the cross of Calvary but the Bible also says that this man who's riding on the white horse this Lord Jesus Christ he's called the King of Kings and he's called the Lord of Lords it is also spoken about this man that out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword so we know that out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ proceeds his word Jesus even spoke in the church age of Pergamos you can read this in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 12 where he speaks that I will come and make war against you with the sword of my mouth so what proceeds from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ is his word his word proceeds from his mouth and as his word is proceeding from his mouth it has the effect that a sword will have in battle that a sword will have in combat praise the name of the Lord so the word of God the Bible is in actual fact a weapon it is a sword a sword that we can use against the enemy and we see that Jesus himself used the word as a weapon against the enemy in Matthew chapter 4 we see that Satan came to the Lord and he came tempting him and he said it is written but then Jesus said it is also written so Satan was quoting the word but then Jesus came and he also quoted the word and he defeated Satan by the word and Satan will be defeated every time by the word of God because the word of God is the sword it is the sword that cuts asunder it is the sword that diminishes it is the sword that gives the victory the word of God is more quick and more sharp than any two-edged sword praise the name of the Lord so this is really the weapon that God places in the hands of his children it is the sword of the word the sword of the Lord and it is only through the sword of the Lord hallelujah it is only through the sword that we can have the victory we can only overcome by the word of God the word is of God is that which can deliver us the word of God is that which can heal us we read even in Psalm 107 in verse 20 where the Bible says he sent forth his word and it healed them and many times 
it's not even necessary to pray for a sick person, but merely the preaching of the word, just the, preke- the, the speaking of the word is able to heal a person. Now, I'm not implying that we should not be praying for the sick. We should be praying for the sick. We should be laying our hands on the sick, as Jesus said in Mark chapter 16. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That is, thus saith the Lord out of the Bible, Mark chapter 16. So we should pray for the sick. We should lay our hands on the sick. But what I'm trying to bring across to you is that the Word of God is so powerful that even just the preaching of the Word, just the speaking of the Word, brings forth healing, brings forth miracles, brings forth salvation, brings forth healing. The Word of God is truly powerful. We see many times throughout the Gospels that Jesus just spoke a word and people became healed. Jesus just spoke a word and demons were driven out. It was just the spoken words of Jesus Christ, the spoken word, the words that He spoke that brought about the miraculous. We see this even from the very beginning from the creation, from the beginning of time. We see that God spoke the word. It was a spoken word. God said, let there be, let there be light. And there was light. Let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. And there was. So we see that God's word is really a powerful substance. Whenever God speaks, it happens whatever God speaks. His word does not return void unto him but it always accomplishes the mission and the purpose for which God sent it forth. So yes, beloved, the sword of the Lord is nothing else than his word. And the sword of the Lord (coughs) is really what cuts off everything, just as a sword can cut. A sword we know can cut off any type of material. There are swords that are so sharp that they can even cut through wood. There are swords that are so sharp that they can cut through plants and trees and whatever forces of nature there may be. But the word of the Lord is even more powerful from that. The word of the Lord can cut off your sin. The word of the Lord can cut off your unbelief. The word of the Lord can cut off your diseases. The word of the Lord can cut off all your unrighteousness. The word of the Lord is truly a sword. It is the sword of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, beloved, the sword of the Lord was given for a purpose. It is because there is a war that is going on. Now we know that swords in the natural are used in generally for warfare now the sword of the Lord is also used for warfare it is used for warfare in the battle between God and Satan and we know that there is a battle going on between God and Satan and this battle originated not on the earth but it originated in heaven hallelujah praise the name of the Lord this battle originated in heaven according to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. The Bible speaks there was a war in heaven and that Satan and his angels fought against Michael and his angels or Michael and his angels fought against Satan and his angels. Now we know that Michael is an archangel and he is a prince of the angels. And when it comes to Michael, we read in Daniel chapter 12 that he is the great force, he is the great prince that stands up for the people of Israel. So he is really that angel that is assigned. He is an angel over angels. And we see in Revelation 12 that Michael, the archangel, fought against the devil and his angels. And there was a war in heaven, and war started in heaven. War did not start on earth, it started in heaven. Just like sin, sin did not start upon the earth, but sin started in heaven. Sin started up there, and then sin came from there to here. Satan, we know himself, was also an angelic being. And before he was called Satan, we know that he was called Lucifer. And Lucifer means light bearer, and he was a light bearer. The Bible even speaks in Ezekiel 28 that he was the anointed cherubim that covereth. So he was really in the presence of God. He was really one that was familiar with the things of God. And we know that the devil himself is very religious. The devil is one that really can come and he can change himself and make himself to look or to seem like an angel of light. Hallelujah. 
and we know also beloved that after this war took place we know that the devil fell and he dragged with his tail the bible speaks in revelation 12 about how did the dragon drag with his tail one third of the stars of heaven now when it comes to stars we know that the bible describes stars as being angels or as being messengers we see this in the revelation 1 where it says that there were seven stars in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne seven stars upon the right hand of him uh, that is called the son of man and we see that these stars the representation of these stars are that they are angels so when satan fell he also dragged some of the angels with him and he also led them into perdition he led them into rebellion and we see that that war that started in heaven was a war that also continued upon the face of the earth we see that it is a war that satan actually went into the garden of eden and he entered into the serpent and as he entered into the serpent we see that he was really the one that was uh, tempting the woman and we, and we know that it was not the man that was tempted but it was the woman as paul writes it also in first timothy chapter 2 it was the woman that was tempted and after she ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree and we see also that she gave unto her husband and he did also eat and that brought about the perdition that brought about the destruction that brought about the fall of humanity when they just obeyed the father when they went against the word of god and that was really a sad thing a sad thing that happened beloved when man fell when man disobeyed the father and through their disobedience they were separated from the presence of god and so many people today are separated from the presence of god because of their disobedience so many people today are separated from the presence of god because they have chosen they have chosen the broad way that leads to destruction and they have turned their backs upon the straight and narrow gate now jesus speaks in matthew 7 from verse 13 he speaks about two ways he speaks about two gates he speaks about two roads the one is the straight and narrow gate and the other one is called the uh, broad way now on the straight and narrow way you find not so many people but that one leads to eternal life but then you have the broad way the broad way that leads to destruction and jesus says many are there be that is upon that one it is the gate that leads the, or the way that leads to hell and there's a saying that it goes like this that the the way to hell is paved with good intentions and many times evil is presented as being good and many times evil is being committed with good intentions and that is many times how people find themselves in difficult situations because of what they allow in their lives and we see really beloved that this war that started in the garden of eden was the war that really paved the way to hell it was really when man fell from the presence of god and the bible says in proverbs 14 verse 12 that there is a way that seemeth right but the end therefore is death and so many people are on that way that way that leads to destruction that way that is paid with good intentions that way that is filled with sin but the only way to heaven and the only way for salvation the only way for someone to be saved is through jesus christ the only way is jesus christ he says in john 14 verse 6 i am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father except through me there's only one way to god and that is through jesus christ the way God came to us is the way that we can go back to God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter number 2, it says in verse 5, that there is one mediator and one man between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. Christ is the only mediator between God and man. Christ is the only way of salvation. Christ is the only means of having forgiveness of sins and having eternal life it is through only through jesus christ that you can receive redemption 
namely the forgiveness of your sins. It is only through Jesus Christ that you can be set free. It is only through Jesus Christ that you can become a partaker of God's kingdom and the eternal inheritance. Because Jesus is the way maker. He made the way, the way on the cross of Calvary. He says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so, so we see, beloved, that that war that was continued in the Garden of Eden, that war continues even up till this day. There is a war against God and Satan. There is a conflict against God and Satan. And this conflict is about the souls of human beings. And we see in the epistle of Jude, the apostle, he even wrote how that Michael the archangel, he was contending with the devil over the body of Moses. And we know that Moses died and he was buried on the Mount of Horeb or Nebo. And it is also spoken that the grave of Moses was never found. But we see that after Moses died in Deuteronomy chapter 34, died and was buried. We see also that in Matthew chapter 17 in the New Testament, Moses appeared with Elijah to the, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> on the Mount of Transfiguration. And one thing is for sure that Moses was resurrected because the Bible says he died, but then the Bible also speaks about him appearing again in Jerusalem on the Mount of Transfiguration. And the ministry of Moses will even continue in the future when we read about it in Revelation chapter 11, where the Bible speaks how that uh, these two witnesses will come and that they will go to the great city, which is called e spiritually uh, Egypt and Sodom. And we know that they will actually be going to Jerusalem, to the city of Jerusalem, and they will be God's witnesses to the people. And we see that after they give their testimony, the Bible even speaks that their power to close the heavens so that during the days of their prophecy it would not rain. And we know there's only one individual in the Bible that is characterized by this, and it is Elijah the Tishbite. And we see that he was the one that really had authority, that had power to close and open the windows of heaven by the prayers that he offered to God to prevent the rain from coming and also to send rain again upon the face of the earth. And we see, beloved, that it is possible that God will send them back. God will send them to continue their ministry. But the bottom line is, beloved, the devil was contending over the body of Moses. The devil was fighting over the body of Moses and he was really he was really having a debate about it and so it is even today that the devil is contending for the souls of people he wants people to his side he wants people to serve him and we see that God also wants to win the hearts of the people and that is why he sent his only begotten son the Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross so that he can win the souls of the people, so that he can save the souls of the people. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16, or in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He that believes in him is not condemned, but he that does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hallelujah. So we see that God made a way of redemption. God made a way of salvation, and that is through Jesus. And God wants to win your heart. God wants to win your soul. He paid a price already on the cross of Calvary so that he can win your soul, so that he can redeem you and so that he can give you everlasting life. But we see that the devil is also contending. He is, he is doing warfare. He is really plotting to win people's souls and to send them to hell, to the place of perdition. Now we know that hell was not made for humans, but hell was made for the devil and his angel. That these angels, that is Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, Hell was made for the devil and his angels. Hallelujah. 
That is how it is, beloved. Hell was not made for man. God never intended that a man should go to hell. But God intended that man should be upon the earth and that a man should really till the soil and that man should serve God's purpose. And God wants man's soul to be saved, to be redeemed, to be set free. God wants man to be a partaker of salvation. Grace, marvelous grace, wonderful grace. Grace that will teach you to turn your back on the world and the things of the world. Grace that will enable you to live soberly, righteously and holy. Grace that will make you really a person of obedience. Grace that will make you a person that loves God. Grace that will make you to do good. Grace that will make you to turn your back upon evil. So we see that there is this war going on for the souls of men. And we see that the souls of mankind is hanging in the balance. But we see also someone else that came to hang in the balance, to hang in the middle. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He really came. He came so that we could be saved so that we could be forgiven the son of god became a sinner so that the sinner could become a son of god that is how great god's salvation is that is how great god's redemption is that is how great god is he is a gracious god he is a loving god he is a perfect god and yes beloved it is only the grace of god that can really touch you in this and set you free i would like to thank jelly and daniels for that comment over there and i do agree god does want men to be a partaker of his grace hallelujah god bless you out there jelly and daniels and thank you for tuning in also all our listeners now beloved usually as i preach i make reference to a lot of scriptures so i would advise that you just get a little notebook like this one and get a pen and just write down the scriptures and just reflect upon the scriptures and just study it for yourself that's why this program is called a study in the word it's an opportunity for us to have a bible study and to hear what god has to say about matters so yes may the lord jesus just bless you so yes beloved we see that god man's soul is very precious to god god regards man's soul so high that God made man the crown of his creation here upon the earth. God even made us in his very own image. That is how proud God is of us. That is how much God loves us. He made us in his own, own image. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 and verse 4, that God made us a little lower than the angels, just a little lower than the angels, and he crowned us with honor and glory praise the name of the lord jesus christ so we see beloved that we are precious in the sight of the lord and god does not want us to perish god does not want us to go to hell god does not want us to be in sin and in shame but god wants us to be free of sin free of shame god wants us to be redeemed god wants us to be enlightened god wants us to be holy god wants us to be happy and that is something that we should never ever forget beloved that god wants us to be happy and christians ought to be the most happy people upon the face of the earth why because we are sons and daughters of god the most high the bible says in the, in john chapter 1 verse 12 that that for those of us that have received him gave he power to become the sons of god or the children of god sons and daughters of god yes god wants us to be his children and he wants to be our father god wants to have a relationship now i myself being a father knows what it's like to have a relationship with my children i know what it's like to spend time with them i know what it's like uh, to sacrifice for them i know what it's like to provide for them i know what it's like to just take care of them and that is exactly the same attitude that god displays towards us you can read in psalm 103 where the bible says that as a father pitieth his children so the lord pitieth them that fear him god really has compassion with us God understands our trials, our tribulations, all our situations, and whatever 
we are going through and what we are facing in this life. God wants to have a relationship with you. And the purpose of this, the, the whole message, the whole Bible is to bring you into a relationship with the Father again. And it's so important that we should have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. That we should really be connected to Him through His Word. And many times people just go to church. They belong somewhere to a church. Their name is written in the book of a church. And they can say that their parents were part of the church and their grandparents were part of the church. But one thing is for sure, beloved, that God does not have any grandchildren. Your parents might have served God. Your parents might have had a relationship with God. But if you don't have a relationship with God, then it doesn't mean that you are right with God. You need to have a relationship with God. Your parents might be God's children, but it doesn't mean that you are God's grandchild. God only has children. God only has sons and daughters. And it's so important that we should get out of this mentality of just being a church goer. Just claiming to belong to this denomination, that denomination, claiming the name of a church, but then we can't even claim the name of Jesus Christ for ourselves. The Lord made a rebuke in the book of Revelation chapter 3. He says that you have the name and that you are alive, but yet you are dead. And so many people, they go to church, they can mention the name of the church, they can sometimes even mention the name of the Lord, but spiritually they are dead. And it's so important that we should be alive, we should live for Christ. And living for Christ is something that takes place on a day-to-day -day basis. It is not about just going to church or reading your Bible on a Sunday. It is not just about praying only on a Sunday, but it is a day-to-day -day walk. You know, Christianity isn't a, just a religion, as people classify it, but it is a lifestyle. It is a way of life. It is a certain way that you live, and you live according to the Word of God. Hallelujah. So, yes, beloved, it is time that you establish a relationship with the Lord your God. It is time that you really come back to the Father. And that is why Jesus came into this world, to reconcile us back to the Father, to bring us back into his presence. We see that <coughs> Jesus is called the second Adam. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul speaks about Jesus being the second Adam. Now we know that the first Adam, the first Adam was a was out of the earth. He was taken from the earth. And we know that God formed his body from the dust of the earth and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And so man became a living soul. So the first Adam was from the earth. But the second Adam is the Lord from heaven. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he really came down as the second Adam to reconcile us back to him. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18 that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He came to do the work of reconciliation. He came to bring us back into the presence of the Father. He came, he bled and he died to give eternal life for you and for me. There's a beautiful song that says, had it not been for a man called Jesus, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, then forever my soul would have been lost. And we give God the thanks and we give him the praise for what he did for us in Christ on the cross of Calvary, that he has reconciled us back to him. And all that you need to do is, is to come home, come back to the Father, bow your knees, Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that he died for your sins on the cross. He was buried and on the third day he rose again. That is what God wants so that he can establish once again the relationship. The relationship that was once in the Garden of Eden. And we know that when God was having this relationship in the Garden of, uh, in the Garden of Eden, the Bible even says that he came on the wind at night and he was having fellowship. He was speaking directly with Adam and Eve. And God today wants to have fellowship with you. The Bible says in 1 John chapter number 1 from verse 4, it says that if we 
uh, walk in the light as he is in the light then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness and it is so important that we must have fellowship fellowship with one another and fellowship with God now we must have fellowship with one another also the Bible speaks about the first Christian church and it is the original church that was founded in the book of Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when God poured out the Holy Spirit we see that this church the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 verse 41 verse 42 it says that they remain steadfastly in the Apostles doctrine in the fellowship in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers and that is how a true Christian's life should be like a true church of Jesus Christ is like that they remain in the Apostles doctrine in the breaking of the bread in the prayers and in the fellowship with one another we need to have fellowship with one another we need to come together we need to speak about the Word of God we need to share the Word of God we need to really gather around the table and we need to eat of the word which is the living bread by which man shall live the Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God that is how precious the word of God is beloved now we know that in the natural we cannot survive without food we need food to sustain our bodies now just as we need food to sustain our bodies so we need the word of God we need the Bible to sustain our souls we need the word of God to feed our souls we need the word of God to strengthen our souls if the natural man needs natural bread so the spiritual man needs spiritual bread and that spiritual bread is the word of God praise the name of the Lord so yes beloved uh, we were uh, talking tonight about the sword of the Lord and Paul was writing to Timothy his son in the faith in 2nd Timothy chapter 2 verse 3 and he was comparing a Christian to a soldier and we know that soldiers are those that represent their country their countrymen their kindred their people they represent them in warfare and we know that the soldier is somebody that needs to be armed he needs to have a weapon he needs to have a weapon to defend himself and also to defend his country and Christians are also soldiers as Paul was saying to Timothy that he should be a soldier and we can read that in 2nd Timothy chapter number 2 and verse 3 where the apostle writes to his son in the faith he says thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier a good soldier of Jesus Christ so Paul is encouraging Timothy to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ and Christ has soldiers, Christ has an army and for us to be a soldier in the army of the Lord we also need to have a weapon, we need to be armed we need to be vigilant, we need to be careful because the Bible says in 1st Peter chapter 5 that the devil, our adversary he walks about as a roaring lion he is the one that is really going and he's trying to see who and what he can devour who he can destroy and the Bible says in John chapter 10 that the thief comes but to none but to kill and to, to destroy and to, to, to slaughter but Jesus has come that we might have life and to have it more abundantly hallelujah so we need to know <coughs> the attacks of the enemy we need to know the tactics of the enemy we need to know how the enemy functions and for us to defend ourselves against the enemy for us as soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ it is so very important beloved that we should be armed with the sword of the Lord we should be armed with the word of the, of the Lord because there are definitely powers of darkness that are operational out there there are really demonic entities that are at work there are really demon spirits evil spirits foul spirits and those spirits are still with us today we read about them in Bible days 
But just because the Bible was written so many thousands of years ago, it, di- it doesn't mean that the demons have disappeared. The demons are still here. The s- evil, foul spirits are still here. And the Apostle Paul was writing about this in Ephesians chapter 6. And I would like to read it to you, beloved, where the Apostle is telling the Christian. Now, this is the same man that compares a Christian to a soldier. And he is the one that is also writing about warfare that is taking place. He says in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to (coughs) withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet short with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Hallelujah. Did you hear that, beloved? He says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that I day in that day and I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Praise the name of the Lord. Now the apostle made it very plain, beloved, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So one thing is for sure, beloved, that the powers of darkness is a reality. There are stuff like workers of iniquity. There are those that are tools of the devil. There are those which the Bible calls soothsayers, magicians. There are those which the Bible calls uh, diviners or diviners. There are those which the Bible calls sorcerers. There are those which the Bible calls witches and wizards. There are those things which the Bible calls powers of the rulers, the rulers of darkness. There are demonic entities out there and they are a reality. And the Bible speaks about them clearly. There are ghosts, there are evil presences out there that have their origin from Satan or that are on the side of the devil. And these beings are even able to perform miracles. The Bible says in Revelation 16 and verse 13, it speaks about three unclean spirits like frogs, which are the spirits of demons that do miracles. And that scripture proves to us, beloved, that Satan, Satan can truly impersonate. He can impersonate even miracles. Revelation 16 verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So there you have it, beloved, spirits of devils being described as unclean spirits like frogs. They resemble frogs. They look like frogs. And those of you that are familiar with this will know that frogs are even used in witchcraft. And witchcraft and all these things are a reality. Now just because it is a reality, it doesn't mean that we should partake of it. God never said that it's not a reality, but God forbade his people. God forbid them to partake of such things because they are connected to the darkness. They are connected to Satan and they will eventually lead to hell and to destruction and eternal condemnation and therefore God calls his people to repent and to turn away from such wickedness 
And therefore, it's so important that we should have discernment of spirit. We should discern the spirits whether they are of God. Not every sign, wonder, and miracle that's taking place has its origin from God Almighty. Now, God does perform signs, wonders, and miracles, as I've said numerous times, and as you can also read in the Bible numerous times, that f since the very beginning, just the creation itself is miraculous. How that God would speak the one moment and the next moment things come into existence. How that God will just say, let there be, and there was. How that God will just speak things into existence. That, uh, that is the book of Genesis. You can go into the book of Exodus and you could see God's miracles. God's hand upon the children of Israel and the many plagues that he sent upon Egypt and how did he deliver he delivered his people hallelujah uh, with a mighty hand and so it goes on and on you can read throughout the Bible how did God did great miracles and God is still able to perform miracles because God is not dead he is alive but we should also take note beloved that the devil is an imposter the devil is an impersonator and the devil will do what he can to deceive people because he's also called the deceiver of the whole world and it's so important that we should have discernment of spirit Paul was listing this as one of the spiritual gifts in 1st Corinthians chapter 12 he speaks about the gift of discerning of spirits and we should discern the spirits we should try the spirits we should test the spirits whether they be of God in 1st John chapter 4 it says these words beloved do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they be of God prove the spirits for many false prophets have come into the world and so it is even today we are living in the time frame that false prophets are really at a huge number the Bible says in Matthew 24 verse 24 they shall arise false Christ and false prophets and they shall do great signs and wonders if it was possible to deceive even the elected and so it is even in this day and in this age that there are many false prophets that are gone out into the world and these false prophets can also do miracles and through the miracles that they are performing they are deceiving people and that's why the only way that you can discern and see whether they are of God is if they preach the true word of God not just making reference to the Bible but sticking sticking to the teachings of the Bible hallelujah that is what is really really so important beloved that we should stay with the teachings of the Bible we should teach what the Bible teaches we should preach what the Bible preaches but those that are false prophets are the ones that lead people astray now these false prophets their prophecies might even be accurate their prophecies might even be hundred percent we read about such a false prophet his name was Balaam in the book of Numbers chapter 20 from chapter 22 up till chapter 24 and he prophesied about Israel and his prophecy was 100% accurate what he said about Israel was the truth but God never condemned the prophecy of Balaam but in Revelation chapter 2 God condemned the teaching of Balaam so people can have the right prophecies it could be accurate prophecies but if the teachings is contrary to the word then it is really where God starts to rebuke and God starts to condemn and God has the right to condemn because God alone is the judge God alone is the righteous judge and therefore God can judge and God can say that he has a problem with certain teachings teachings that do not have their origin from him so God wants us to repent from this darkness God wants us to turn away and the only way that we can really fight against these powers of darkness is as the power as the Bible says in Ephesians 6 that we should take up the sword of the spirit we should take up the full arm of God but he speaks about the sword of the spirit which is the word of God there Paul calls it the sword of the spirit Ezekiel calls it the sword of the Lord and then Paul writes in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 that the Lord is the spirit so whether you are saying the spirit or you're saying the Lord the Lord is the spirit in John chapter 4 verse 24 the Bible says God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in truth 
and in spirit hallelujah god is the great spirit he is the eternal spirit he is the great i am praise the name of the lord and we see that this spirit this great spirit he has a sword and that sword is his word hallelujah and his word is really the power and his word is really what gives us the ability to overcome the devil the devil cannot but flee for the word of god the devil has no other choice but to flee when the word of god comes his way satan might come for this he might come for that but when it comes to the word of god the word of god will defeat satan every single time hallelujah the word of god is powerful you know god's word is so powerful that uh, god respects his own word god honors his own word god fulfills his own word when god says something god does it god is not like us that says something and then we change our minds and we turn our backs and we just uh, go in a different direction no god is not like that beloved but God respects his own word. God sticks to his own word. God fulfills his own word. And that's why we can put our trust and our confidence in him. The Bible says in uh, the book of Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19 that God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. So God cannot lie. The Apostle Paul even confirms this in the book of Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. He says, let God be true and let every man be a liar. Hallelujah. So God's word is reliable. You can build your life upon the word of God. There was somebody that said many years ago, he said, I would rather stand upon the word of God than to stand in heaven. And somebody asked him, but why would you not want to stand in heaven? Now, he didn't say he doesn't want to stand in heaven, but he said we would rather stand on the word of God than to stand in heaven. And, he's, and somebody asked him, but why? And then he said these words, because heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. That is Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. That is how reliable the word of God is. And the word of God is also compared to a rock. You can read this in Matthew chapter number 7 where the Bible speaks about those that hear the word of God and obey the word of God. They are the ones that are really the, the, the ones that is like a wise man that builds his house upon the rock. But those that just hear the word and don't obey the word, they are the ones that build their house upon the sand. And when the storm comes, the house gets wiped away. But if you build your house on the rock, the rock is the word of God. The rock is the foundation, the solid foundation. Hallelujah. And also the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that Christ was that rock. Hallelujah. So Christ is the rock. Christ is the word of God. So let us stay with the word of God, beloved. Let us build our hope and our trust, our confidence upon the word of God. God's word is infallible. God's word is in heaven. God's word is inspired. And God's word is the truth. God's word is eternal. So put your hope, put your faith, put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, I trust that this short presentation has been a great blessing to you. So if there's any one of you that are tuned in now or that will be viewing this uh, recording later, if you want me to come over to your church to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with your congregation, those of you that are ministers, you're welcome to contact me on 078-721-9991. 078-721-9991. You can give me a call, send me a WhatsApp, send me a text message. And then I would be more than happy to come over and share the word of God with you, with your congregation. If there's anyone that would like to start a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, they would like to accept him as their Lord and as their Savior, also more than welcome to contact me. If there's anyone that would like to know more about the message of the hour, which I'm proclaiming here on the radio Easter River, also more than welcome to contact me. If there's anyone that is in need of prayer, you're also more than welcome to contact me with god all things are possible now i'm just a man and i might fail and i might make many mistakes 
And don't ever put your hope or trust or your confidence in me, but put your trust in the living God that cannot lie and whose word and promises are forever true. So may the Lord Jesus Christ just richly and abundantly bless you with my prayer. <coughs> and please spread the word out there. Tell your friends, your loved ones, uh, your neighbors, whoever you know, your fellow workers, acquaintances. Tell them about our local radio station, Radio Easter River. Tell them they can download the app on the Play Store or they can listen on www.radioeasterriver.co.za and just tell them also about the program and may the Lord bless you and may grant unto you the desires of your heart and may you just have a closer walk with the Lord. I shall now close this program with a word of prayer. So wherever you are, just close your eyes, bow your heads and put your faith, your trust, your hope and your confidence in Jesus Christ the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Dearest Lord, I thank you for giving me this wonderful privilege, this opportunity through technology, Lord, from a distance that I'm able to transmit your word to the peoples of the world. And now, Lord, I pray that your word will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish the mission and the purpose of which you send it. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your word being the seed, the seed is thou be sown, I pray, Lord, that it will touch every heart and life, Lord, and that it will accomplish the mission and the purpose for which you sent it. Thank you, Lord, for touching everyone. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your word will bring forth a great harvest and that you will receive the praise, the honor, and the glory. We pray for those that are sick and afflicted. We pray that you will touch them, Lord, regardless of what the disease is. Lord, there are those with tumors, cancers, those with... Uh, TB, Lord, there are those with blood pressure problems, those with diabetes, Lord, there are those, Lord, <coughs> with disease that doctors cannot diagnose, there are those, Lord, that have the flu, there are those that have COVID, Lord, you know all diseases, Lord, but we know that you are the healer, you are the Lord, our healer, and I just pray, Lord, just touch them, touch them and heal every sick and afflicted, there are those going through struggles, Lord, sometimes financially sometimes lord it can be at work sometimes it can be in the house but i just pray lord that you will calm the storm that you will just speak your word into their hearts and lives i pray lord jesus christ that you will just be with us and even those that have become backslidden lord just call them back and i just pray that you will touch their hearts even those that are lost lord those that don't know you those that have never known you I pray you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you will just, Lord, just save them, Lord, because you are the Savior. Only you can save them. Only you can heal them. And thank you, Lord, that you will be with them. There are parts of the world where there's wars going on, Lord. We pray for peace. We pray also for the peace of Jerusalem and that you will bless your people Israel. <coughs> and we pray, Lord Jesus, also for our government. We pray, Lord Jesus, for those that are in power that you will inspire them with wisdom, with knowledge, Lord, and that you will give them guidance so that they may lead the people and that we may lead a peaceful life upon the earth. We pray for those that are preachers and ministers of the gospel, that you will strengthen them, Lord. Lord, that you will lay your words within their mouths and that you will just anoint them, Lord, and inspire them in the most marvelous way, Lord. And I thank you that you will do great and miraculous things. Give unto your church, the body of believers, discernment of spirits, that they may not believe every spirit, Lord. Be not deceived out there. And, O oh Lord Jesus, just cleanse us and purify us continually by the washing of the waters of the word. And I thank you, therefore, Lord. Thank you that you've answered our prayers, Lord. There are those that are tuned in that have prayer requests which I'm not familiar with, Lord. I don't know them. I don't know their hearts. I don't know their lives. But you know all things, Lord, and nothing is hidden before you. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you will listen to those prayers that's coming from the heart and thank you that you will answer each and every prayer, Lord, and that you will not allow your people to be put to shame. Lord, we pray for those that are going through difficulties, Lord, those that have marriage troubles, Lord, those that have troubles with their children. We pray, Lord, that you will just touch them, Lord, in the most marvelous way and that you will bring harmony. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Now, beloved, thank you for those that were tuned in on the program, A Study in the Word. 
God willing, I will be back Sunday morning on the program, the message of the hour. Please pray for me, keep in your prayers that God will give me boldness to speak his word, that he will continue to inspire and anoint me and open doors. And may the Lord be with you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.